give your neighbor a high five. Tell them, I'm so glad you're in the house of the Lord. Amen. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you so much. Wow, you could have your seats. It's so good to be here this morning. I am so, I'm so honored and blessed to just think that it's exactly two years since we had our first gathering. Like two years. Can you believe it? January, uh, November 21st, 2021. You are there. How many were there in that first gathering? Let me just see. What? Yeah, they're here. Wow. And then look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done to us as we've just been waiting upon him. And so it's such a privilege. I just look at what the Lord has done and my heart, my heart is full. You know, it's interesting. Um, this, this morning as uh, Pastor James led us, I, I just kept having just a sense that God is raising an army. And I, I remember we shared that in the morning, that God is raising an army. There's an army that is rising up. And that God is going to, we are going to witness miracles in our generation. We're going to see things we never thought were possible in our generation. And so I'm so excited. I'm so glad you're here. By the way, look at your neighbor again. Tell them, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're not missing out huh, in the thing that God is doing in our generation. Thank you so much. For all of you who are watching online, we love you. We're so grateful for all the watch parties. We're so happy that you're with us. May God bless you. We see you. And may God just, I'm so, may everything, we've prayed that everything that happens in this house will happen where you are. In Jesus' name. I'm so honored today and privileged to have a good friend of mine who I'm going to be introducing a little later. Uh, he is the pastor of Elevation Church in Lagos, uh, Pastor Godman. And uh, it's so good to see you, brother. Thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, he's with Pastor Mensa behind, who's his uh, colleague in ministry. And, and so it's great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. He's actually going to come up and share something later. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got to have some Nigerian fire in the house. <laughs> wow. I, I, you're here to represent. Come on. Osai is feeling like, yes, finally. We need some Nigerian fire in this house. Yeah, we thank God. We already have a local Nigerian fire. <laughs> By the way, I mean, there's a whole contingent from Mavuno Kampala in the house. Like you guys. I mean, this is not a joke, huh? So here's why I want to honor these guys. I mean, for, for us guys from Nairobi, this is a sacrifice to be here. Like we took time off work to be here. These guys didn't take time off work. They bought air tickets and they're here to be here as well as time off. We just want to honor you and bless God for you. Our Kampala family, we love you. You're such an amazing family. By the way, if you've never been to Mavuno Kampala, you're missing out. You're missing out. It's a happening Mavuno church. I don't know if the Mavuno Bujumbura guys are in town yet. They're there. What? Mavuno Bujumbura as well uh, drove in for this. And wow, they, they flew in for this. And that's just an amazing. I mean, there's such. And let me just tell you, Mavuno Bujumbura is another happening place. Like, you actually have to witness Bujumbura to understand. Like, you guys think I tell you stories, by the way. You know, it's interesting because I told, I told guys about Mavuno Bujumbura. Then Pastor Godi came with me to Mavuno Bujumbura. Pastor Godi, am I lying? My stories are true. Pastor Godi came back saying, what are we doing in Mavuno Church? Like, seriously, these guys, there's just something that God is doing there. There's an army that Pastor Mishu and Viola are raising up there that is just amazing. And we glorify God for you. Thank God for you. Thank you for being here. We also thank God for, I, I saw Mavuno Kisumu in the house. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> this is, a, this is a, I think the farthest church in, in Kenya that is here. Uh, no, no, actually, well, they are competing. Because I also saw Mavuno Diani in the house. Mavuno Diani, can they stand? Where are they? Where are they? Oh, there they are. <laughs> We bless God for Mavuno Diani as well. There's a whole contingent that has come from Diani. And my goodness, this is just... I saw Mavuno Migori as well. There's a team from Migori as well that is here. By the way, Mavuno Migori is our first... It's a historic church. It's a first Luo-speaking Mavuno church. By the way, from, from English, you have to move to Luo first before you go anywhere else. And uh, we are so grateful for Mavuno Migori. Like a church that does Mavuno in Luo. Come on. 
It's so amazing. I, like, I have to go to that church uh, just to see what that looks like. I'm so proud of Pastor Clint and the work that he and his team are doing in that place. And to every other church that is represented, we just honor you. We thank God for everyone that is here. Um, the people who know their God. The people who know their God. That's what our theme is for this year. The people who know their God. That's what I want to speak about uh, in this gathering. That's what I want to speak about today. The people who know their God. That's actually my theme as I think about this weekend. The people who know their God. This is our theme, Daniel 11.32. It says, the people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. That's a King James version. In the NIV, it says, the people who know their God will firmly resist him. And it's interesting because these things, they seem like what is, doing exploits, resisting, what is all that about? I want to talk about this scripture. It's been our theme verse, but I haven't preached about this verse the whole year. And I want to give you some context today for this verse. But as I do so, let me first start by asking, how many people know that we are living in biblical times? Yeah? We, we really are living in interesting times. If you've got any sense of biblical prophecy, you look at the things that are going on around us, and you have to ask yourself, what in the world is happening? Things that we never thought could ever happen have happened in our lifetime in a very short time. And they've become normal. I mean, we were alive in the COVID-19 pandemic. It shut the whole world down. And we are in our homes. You know, in the book of Revelation, it talks about plagues upon the whole world. You know, those things you read in the Bible and you think, how will that ever happen? I mean, we're the generation that has seen what a plague looks like across the whole, in fact, several plagues in succession. And they tell us that we're preparing for others that are to come. Rapidly followed by the war in Russia and Ukraine. And you know what, what that did to the world. And then after that, the war in Israel. Some of you grew up in prophetic end time preaching Bible churches. A few of you. The rest of you are in bars. People are being taught about how the end, the world is ending. <laughs> I won't tell your neighbor, he's not talking about you. <laughs> you look like you're saved when you're born. <laughs> so, so in those churches, I remember that you go to some of those churches, they would talk about the end times. And they'll talk about uh, how Russia and China will fight against Israel and, and Gog and Magog. And some of you remember those things from the book of Revelation. And you remember, you'd, you'd sit down and think, how will that ever happen? How will Russia ever fight and China ever come together and then fight Israel? Oh my God. What a shock. Right now, if you told people those things, they'd be like, yeah, we can see how it's happening. We can actually easily see how a third world war can happen like this. Like you wake up one day and the whole world is at war. I woke up one day and I realized all of Africa had aligned, either for Israel or for Palestine. And countries that should actually be here discussing about why are we as Africans, why is this our fight? This thing has become so vitriolic and you can actually see the continent divided with a war that is not even their war. And that's how the world begins to end. This is how you begin to see things and you're like, wow, the things in the Bible actually are not as far-fetched as what we thought. You know, it's very interesting because as we look at our economic situations, I don't know which country you're from, but in Kenya, I think uh, the price of fuel has gone up like... How many hundred times? Like, it's crazy. Like, we're living in times where you think, if somebody had told me three years ago the price of fuel today, I'd have said, you're a liar. It's impossible. Get thee behind me, Get thee behind me Satan. Stop predicting bad things for my country. But that's how we are. You even wonder, how are people alive? The situation is not just in Kenya. It's global. We're living in just times. And then they tell us, the worst has not yet come. They tell us, you haven't even seen what begins to happen if the war in Israel becomes a serious war. If Iran gets drawn into that war, uh, as seems to be, and as the warmongers around the, 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 the planet are pulling their, their forces in to grind their axes, and you're looking and you're thinking, my gosh, do you guys know what will happen if there's a war in the Middle East? Do you know what the price of fuel, they were talking about it becoming 300 shillings the other day. That's a joke compared to what it will become if that war actually happens. And, and you look at these things and you ask yourself, when the foundations are shaken, what do the righteous do? That's what the psalmist asks. When he looks at the world and he sees all the turmoil and all the challenges, he asks that question. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? I'm going to come back to our theme verse. Because I believe the answer to that question is the people who know their God. 
the people who know their God. Daniel wrote these words and he was prophesying about a future time. He wrote these words 500 and something years before Christ. But he was talking about a history that is so accurate when you understand and you begin to match the predictions of the history, the, the, the prophecies he wrote, and you match them to the reality that happened afterwards, it's almost impossible. The accuracy is too much. Daniel 11, 32, it actually happens in chapter 11. And in chapter 11, there are about 135 prophecies. And almost every single one of them can be matched to an actual world event that happened. And people look, in fact, scholars, if you, by the way, just go to Wikipedia and ask, when was the book of Daniel written? And scholars have come to the conclusion, it is impossible that this book was written 500 years before Christ. It's impossible that Daniel could have known these things. And so they usually tell you the book of Daniel was probably written 160 years before Christ. Because that's when those things had happened. And the person who wrote could not have written unless they knew those things. Oh, come on, somebody. What a shock. They don't, know, they don't know who our God is. They don't know that our God sees the future. In fact, for God, there's no future. He's outside of time. And he's able to actually tell. It's, it's like he can write history before history happens. Because history is his story. And that's exactly what we see happening in the book of Daniel. Daniel 11. It's, it's, it's probably the, the most exhaustive prophecy in the whole of scripture. Just in detail. Daniel was a government official. And he was captured when he was 16 years old and he was taken with some fellow captives from Israel by King Nebuchadnezzar to, to Babylon. And when he was taken to Babylon, I mean, these guys were forced to enter the king's uh, uh, for, uh, 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 army, uh, not, not army, his, his team. This king was brilliant. He was actually, ba Babylon was one of the world's first superpowers. And the reason they became so brilliant is because unlike the Assyrians who were like the, the kind of mini superpower that came before them, Instead of destroying peoples, they co-opted peoples. They are the ones who began understanding col colonialism that was perfected later by the Romans. And what they would do is they would come to your country and they would take the best people and take them to their country. And so this guy was surrounded by the most genius uh, scholars from all the countries he had captured. All the nobles, all the sharp people, he would take them with him. And Daniel was among the Israelites, the leading Israelites who were taken into Babylon to join the king's court. And he would make them his advisors. And he understood that you need people with different ideas, different places. I want to bring all that to make Babylon great. And so Daniel was one of the people who actually uh, was allowed by God to be in his court. Daniel lived from when he was a young man until in his 80s. And Babylon in the time had several kings, and then they were overthrown by the next superpower. The next superpower was called Persia. And Persia came up and ascended, and the Persians came and took over Babylon. But Daniel was not kicked out. Daniel remained. Listen, this is a lesson for somebody here. That job you're in, it is God who appointed it for you. And when God says it's time to go, you will go. But before that, it's not your boss who decides when you leave. It is God in heaven. You know, some of us are so terrified about our bosses and our jobs. We can't do anything. It's like you're so beholden. You're so afraid of being fired. And you don't understand your God is in heaven. He's the one who appointed you. And he's the one who will decide when it's time to leave. And he's put you there to work with excellence. And as long as you're representing him and serving with excellence, you're there on his timetable. So, so, so stop, stop fearing to go to church. Stop fearing to go for disciples. You need to say, hey, at this point, I have, I have a discipleship group in my church. It's when we pray for the company. You need me to actually go for that dis discipleship group. So on Wednesdays, that's the one day I ask to leave by five because I need to be my... Come on, somebody. Have some confidence in who you are. Yeah, stop acting like the boss is afraid. Stop being so afraid. By the way, I'll tell you something, a secret about bosses. Bosses actually like confident employees. Yeah, these people who are always scared and you're always running around doing, you'll be the first one to go when the axe comes. Because they look and say, this one is, you know, this one actually, am I talking, are there some bosses in the house who can co-opt? Yeah, when, it's, when you're keeping people, you keep the confident ones. Because you know, these are the ones who have something for my company. And so never be one of those people who, you got a job, we prayed for you in church, you got a job. Huh? Now you're telling us you can't come for gathering. You can't come for family night. You can't come for 430 prayers. Because, some, because your job, you're such a... Do we know how busy you are? You're following the boss, not Jesus anymore. 
By the way, can I tell you a secret? I recently prayed for Mavunai to lose their job. Yeah. I actually prayed. There's somebody who I prayed for to get a job. And that job has become so all-encompassing for that person. Even their marriage is not doing well. Their ministry is suffering. Their relationships are suffering because of the job that we prayed for. And at some point I told the Lord, Lord, if it means taking away this job so that you can return this person to how they used to love you, take it away from them. Yeah. Yeah. You need to understand like Daniel, God is the one who appointed you. He's the one who gave you that job. Daniel prayed three times a day. The Bible tells us. Even when the king said you can't, he said, king, it's not you who appointed me to this job. It is God. When the time comes for God to fire me, I will be fired. But in the meantime, I will pray. Yeah. We need to have some Daniels. We need to have some Daniels in our generation. Any Daniels in the house today? Yeah. This, this is who this man was. This is who this man was. But there are, I love the Mavunites. Some of you guys are so bold. I've actually had people telling me, me, I tell my boss when it's gathering time, by the way, I'm going to pray for the company. I need a day off because this company needs prayer. And they're not lying. They will be here praying for the company. And the boss is like, when this one goes for gathering, something happens to our bottom line. Yeah, we need to have some bold people. That's who Daniel was. And you know, it's interesting because the Bible tells us that Daniel, when he was in his 80s, he took an eight, a, a 21 day fast. Again, now some of you used to fast when you're young. Now today you're like too old to fast. This guy was 80 years old. He was still working for government because those days you don't retire until the king says you retire. And at 80, he was praying that God would speak. And for 21 days, he just sought God. And the Bible says on the 24th day after the fast was over, the angel Gabriel appeared. And the angel Gabriel, this is Daniel chapter 10. The angel Gabriel told him, from the day that you started praying, I was sent from heaven. And he says, but on my way here, the, the prince of Persia opposed me. You need to understand something, that we are living in a spiritual reality. Persia was a superpower. And the word that God was coming to give, was giving Daniel through the angel Gabriel was for the people of Israel. And the superpower, the demonic superpower that was ascendant in that day did not want that word to get to Daniel. So as much as God dispatched the angel, Gabriel was blocked by the prince of Persia. I used to think prince of Persia was a video game. It's actually a demon. It's the name of a demon. <laughs> yeah, the prince of Persia is actually a demonic prince. And so Daniel, I mean, uh, Gabriel is fighting this angel. And he tells Daniel, actually what made me, allowed me to fulfill my mission is that the angel Michael came to my aid. Angel Michael was the angel over the people of Israel. And so God, so, so the angel who was guarding Israel stopped what he was doing and went to fight this, uh, this Lucifer, this, this demonic prince. And he stopped him and held him so that Gabriel could go and do his work. And the crazy thing is, at the end of Daniel chapter 10, Gabriel says, I've given you the message. Now allow me to go back and fight the prince of Persia. So it's like he told, he, he told Mo, uh, Michael, Michael, leave Israel for a bit. Come hold this guy because this message is for your people. And then afterwards he goes and tells him, I'm going back to finish my assignment and fight this prince of Persia. And he says, after that, the prince of Greece will come. Oof. Guys, you need to understand. We are living in amazing times. It's very easy for you to think that all the things in front of your fingers, the ones you're seeing now are what reality is. But there's an ultimate reality behind your reality. And Daniel was being, his eyes were being opened to begin to realize, my goodness, when you're praying at 4.30, there are things happening in the spiritual realm. Yeah, there's some things happening that you may not even understand that are happening. There's certain territory that is being taken because of the power of your prayer. I actually believe that the reason that the king, the prince of Israel, the, the, uh, the, the angel uh, Gabriel was able to come and the prince of Michael was able to be released is because of the 21-day fast. That because Daniel was fasting and praying, spiritual warfare was happening. You need to understand there's something powerful that happens when we pray. And so on to Daniel chapter 10, verse 14. Gabriel tells Daniel, I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. For this vision concerns a time yet to come. And so he, he begins to explain. He begins to break down. And the whole, of, uh, the, the whole of Daniel chapter 11 going into 12, that's all a breakdown. Verse by verse, he's telling Daniel, here's what's about to come in the future. And in Daniel 11 too, remember, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you what the people who know their God 
will be strong and do exploits means. I'm just giving you a background to what this theme verse that we've been talking about this year means. So in Daniel chapter 11, at the very beginning, he starts to tell him, here's what history will look like going forward. And he says, three kings will arise. Uh, he says, uh, three more kings will arise in Persia. And then a fourth, who will be far richer than all the others. And when he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. So basically he's saying, Persia is still going to stay around for a while. And they're going to have some serious kings. And these kings, history tells us what their names were. They were amazing, amazing kings. Three very powerful kings. One of them was King Xerxes. Anybody watch the movie 300? That guy, that was actually one of the kings who was about to come. And he was the, the king who stirred up. He's the third king. Keep, keep that thing up on the screen. He's the third king who stirs up the world against Greece. And he actually went, he fought the Spartans. Remember that army? The, Gre the Spartans are the ones who tried to stop him from entering into Greece. He fought them. He destroyed them eventually after losing a lot. And then he went and destroyed Athens and he raised Greece, Greece to the ground. He was not the last king of Persia, but he's the king who woke up Greece. He, he, he stoked the serpent. He pushed into Greece and woke up Greece to begin to realize that they also have something to say on the world stage. There are four kings after him, but another king arose. And the Bible tells us a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. And oh, Sorry, that, that's a fourth. That's Zaxus. Let's go to verse 3 because it talks about what happens next. He says, then a mighty king will arise who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. So the history tells us that the next power that arises on the world stage is Greece. And Greece is ruled by a young man. Some of you know his name. Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is that mighty king. He was anointed. He was powerful. There's nothing he could do wrong. Any battle he fought, he won. He was a king, he, he basically, his father was called King Philip. And King Philip is the one who got the Greeks to rally together. And then he died before he could attack Persia. And this young boy came and became the king. And from then on, there is no battle he lost. His whole life, he never lost a battle. He marched all the way to India. And he conquered all the countries there. The Bible, tell, uh, not the Bible, historians tell us. That by the time he conquered Egypt, he conquered Bab everything that was there to be conquered. In fact, historians tell us at one point in his 30s, he wept. Because he couldn't see anybody else to conquer. <laughs> like he looked around, which other countries can I de destroy? And there are none. Like all the countries had bowed down before him. But a crazy thing says, the Bible says, verse 4. Just go to verse 4 because it's interesting. It says, after he has risen, his empire will be broken up and parceled. So at the height of his wealth, when he was 32 years old, he died of a mysterious disease. Uh, he just died. Like, he was invincible. Nobody could stop him. One day he just died. <laughs> I wonder if Alexander, in his height of power, thought it was about him. Because that's what wealthy, rich, successful people think. He doesn't know. Your story was written many years ago. <laughs> You're actually a pawn. There's a story that is bigger. God's story is much bigger than your story. And he dies, and four generals, because he has no, he's too young, he's not even had time to have a wife. And four generals are the ones, the powerful generals, uh, who lead these four powerful armies. They take over, and they fight among themselves. And they actually divide the kingdom into four. And the rest of chapter 11 is breaking down the, the, what happens between those two. Two of them become very powerful. One is called the king of the north. The north is where uh, Iraq is uh, today. Uh, that whole Iraq, uh, uh, Le Sir Syria area, and that's the king of the north. And then there's a king of the south who is where today Egypt is. Uh, because uh, th the Greeks ruled Egypt as well. They were the greatest power that had ever been seen. And so these two kings, the rest of chapter 11, I challenge you to read it for yourself. They fight. And it tells us in details the things that, if you actually do a chart where you compare prophecy, history, prophecy, history, Everything that Daniel says these kings will do, they actually do. It's so startlingly, uh, remarkably accurate. In fact, it says, um, it's, it says something. It says uh, about Alexander, uh, the rest of the chapter. It says that one, okay, the kingdom is based in Syria. The other, the king of the north. They have treachery between them. They actually lie to each other. They deceive each other. They are fighting for raw materials. Basically, they are two superpowers that are just fighting. 
Uh, they're holding each other. One goes and raids the other, the other one who raids the other. The king of the north has a little more success. And it's because the northern part, Syria, Iraq, was actually called the Fertile Crescent. Uh, in those days, that was actually one of the most fertile places in the world. And this man had a lot, the, whoever the king was there had a lot of wealth and had a lot of uh, uh, agricultural productivity. And so because of that, they could marshal big armies. And so they were always a little stronger than the king of the south. But the Bible tells us the most powerful king of the north uh, would arise. History tells us actually there's a man called Antiochus III that he arose and he became extremely powerful, and he won a lot of battles. But then he became too ambitious. After beating the king of the south, he became too ambitious, and he decided to go west into Europe. And the Bible tells us he was disciplined because he stirred up another serpent. Somehow these superpowers are always stirred up by a superpower that overreaches itself. Yeah, so we see that in modern history. Some of the, fight, the fights that are happening in the Middle East right now are happening because a certain superpower overreached themselves. I'm not mentioning names. So, so basically what happens is the Romans, this man hits the Romans. And the Romans wake up and they start to fight as well. Daniel 11, 18 to 19 tells us the king of the north will turn his attention to the coastlands, taking many of them. But a commander will put an end to his insolence and turn his insolence back on him. <laughs> and after this, he will turn back towards the fortress of his country, but he will stumble and fall to be seen no more. That's what happened to King Antiochus III. He met a general called Manius Achilles Glabrio, and this man disciplined him, chased him, and this most powerful king in the world, he, by the time he reached home, by the way, he died. He was actually assassinated. Uh, and it's so, like I said, look, you're reading history, but you're reading it before it was written. Wow. This is how the Bible is. It's such a powerful uh, book. It says in Daniel 11, 21, he will be succeeded by a, contempo, a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure. He will seize it through intrigue. So basically what happens is when this guy dies, a certain a war breaks out and there's just this succession thing happening around him. But there's one guy who is sharp and political. He's the smartest guy around. He knows how to play people against each other. He's not a royal person. He doesn't deserve anywhere to be near a king. But he ends up con colluding and making people fight enough that he just jumps in and becomes a king. And he's called Antiochus. He, he names himself Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. Epiphanes means God manifest. He basically declares himself to be God manifest. This Antiochus was actually an early manifestation of the Antichrist. This is the first time in the scripture when you actually start to see a person who claims to be God and decides to fight God's people. And the way it happens is this guy seizes a kingdom. And when you read, the, again, read 11 because you're going to see his story. Through deceit, through manipulation, he never speaks the truth. He just sets kingdoms against each other. And that's how he gains his power. However... And by the way, I really wish I had time to go prophecy by prophecy. But remember, I told you there are 135. <laughs> we'll, take, we'll take the whole of the gathering talking about these prophecies. But you know, you, you have time, okay. <laughs> Ultimately, Antiochus makes the same mistake his leader did before him. He goes west and he's disciplined again by the Romans. You know, it's very interesting because in Daniel uh, 11, 29... It says, at the appointed time, he will invade the south again. I want to ask you, what does it mean by at the appointed time? Who appoints that time? Yeah. I want you to understand, you are living in the appointed time. Yeah. There is nothing historical or accidental about you being here right now. You are living in an appointed time. God already knew that you would be in a gathering like this. God already knew you would be born in this generation. That you will not be born in your parents' generation when things were cheap and the price of oil was affordable and there was no internet. God knew that this is your generation. At the appointed time, this king is going to do an invasion. He doesn't understand. You are simply carrying out the appointed time. And as he's going at the appointed time, it says to invade the south again. This time the outcome will be different. He was expecting the same outcome as he had always had. But it says ships of the western coastlands will oppose him. And he will lose heart. 
Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the holy covenant. So here's what happens. That as this man Antiochus was going to attack Egypt, history tells us, and by the way, this is 300 years. Uh, Daniel is writing this thing 300 years before it happens. It tells us that a general, a commander of Rome called Popilus Lenus, that this man actually came and confronted Antiochus. Antiochus is going to fight as he usually does. Unknown to him, Rome has been growing stronger and stronger and stronger. And now Rome has actually become the superpower. He doesn't even know the power has gone. That's how the world operates. You know, right now we live in a situation where we have superpowers that are so strong, they look like they will always be there. But you know what? When you look at history, superpowers come and superpowers go. So he's going down, and this Roman general Lenas comes and stands in front of Antiochus and tells him, you need to go back home. Rome has decided you're not going to fight. And Antiochus is so mad, but he can't do anything because he realizes, my goodness, this is so embarrassing. So he tells Lenas, <laughs> this is... Uh, Again, you know, you read the history, you start laughing because it's like God knew because he says he will lose heart. You know what happened? Lenas, he told General Lenas, he told him, I need to think about this. Give me some time to think about this with my generals. And Lenas took a stick and drew a circle around him and told him, you have all the time you want. But before you leave this circle, you need to have made that decision. Yeah. Leaving this circle is a decision you better have made a decision. Can you imagine being told that in front of your soldiers? And the Bible says what? That the western coastlands will oppose him and he will lose heart. Antiochus realized there's nothing he could do. They had called his bluff. And so he said, okay, fine, I'll go home. And he was so furious. He was so furious. So what did he do? He went on his way up. He went to one of the kingdoms that he had conquered before, Judah. Because the people of Israel were under his leadership. And he had been trying to force them to become Greek. He had actually been putting some things there to try and influence their religion. He didn't like Judaism. He didn't like the fact that these people worshipped one God. That they didn't like his gods. Because he believed in the gods of the Greeks. Uh, Jupiter and, and Zeus and all those gods. And he didn't like that. So he had been trying to impose. He had been trying to seduce them. He had, been trying to, he had even put a priest. He had, he, had, he had even put a new priest. He had deposed the old priest. Put a new priest there. And then he was bribed by another priest. So he, he removed that priest. He put the second priest in charge. And then what happened is some people resisted. So when he went back, on his way back, he was told about how this, these guys are resisting. And you know how bullies are, eh? When you've been defied by a bigger bully, you go and look for the small one so that you can show him that you're somebody. <laughs> so he decides, I'm going to show these people who I am. And he goes home and he vents his fury. The Bible says in verse 30, he will return and show favor to those for, who forsake the covenant. He basically had the ones who had forsaken the covenant, the priests, he had actually put some, place, some things in place for them. He had made them, by the way, some of them had even to, to carry favor with him. Some Jews had gone as far as to reverse their circumcision operation. Like, I don't even know how the technology of the day would allow someone. It's hard enough to reverse a tattoo. Those of you who like tattoos, those things are for life. I don't know how you reverse circumcision. But historians tell us some of them, to appease the king and to show him how they were on his side, they had actually tried to reverse the signs of the covenant in their life. And the king had actually appeased them. He had given them bribes to help them. But the Bible says that he found some of the Jews now are beginning to arise and say, you can't do this. And had begun to even oppose those he had put in place. And verse 31 says, his armed forces will arise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. They will set up the abomination that causes desolation. So the, the script, uh, history tells us in December, 16, uh, one, six, uh, December 168, that King Antiochus decided to put an end to this nonsense once and for all. On his way back from being humiliated by the Romans, he went and he sacked the temple. He dis he, they, they, they basically came and just massacred people. And then what he did is he took a pig and took it into the Holy of Holies. First of all, he knocked down the, the, the altar that was there and he put up an altar to, Ju to Jupiter. He actually put a statue of his god Jupiter in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And then he got a pig and they slaughtered it 
right where they used to do the sacrifice. As a high priest would do the sacrifice. And then they took the pig blood and they scattered it across the whole temple. They basically smeared it. It was just a way of desecration. This guy, by the way, this, that's a very spiritual act. The man knew what he was doing. They were desecrating the temple. And after that, he put back his priest in charge and they brought temple prostitutes to operate from the temple. This is the abomination that causes desolation. The Jews were aghast. They never believed something like this could happen. And he banned any sacrifices to Jehovah. He says, you cannot worship. In this country, you cannot worship or pray to Jehovah. Wow. This is what happened. He did all this. Verse 32 tells us, with flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. So basically, he, the ones who violated now, he began to just make his friends. Things were so difficult. And that's where our verse comes in. Daniel 32, 11, part B. But the people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The people who know their God shall be strong and firmly resist him. That's what this verse is about. That the forces of the Antichrist are rising in our world, God's people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're getting into a time when it's not going to be comfortable to be a Christian. Ah, my goodness, it's not even comfortable now. On social media, there's so many of us who don't, all your friends, if they found out you're in church today, they'd be shocked. Yeah, because we don't talk about our faith. And we're getting to a time when oppression is arising against the faith. But the people who know their God shall be strong and firmly resist him. There's an army rising up. Yeah. There's an army rising up. There's some people who think that what we're doing in Mavuno Church is building personality cults. What we're doing in Mavuno Church is just getting excited about nothing. What we're getting in Mavuno Church is just wasting people's time. We're wasting people's money. Why, why should people not be working and building the nation? Why should they be in the house of God on a, on a Friday? Surely Sunday is already there for them. I've had all these things said, by the way. Ah, come on, they don't understand ultimate reality. The people who know their God shall be strong. As we enter these final days, because I believe we are entering into a serious stage. The God is setting the stage for some interesting things in this season. I believe that God wants a people who know him. Because they will be strong and firmly resist him. It's interesting because in history, there's a group that did that. There's a family, a man called Judas. Judas Maccabeus. And, and this man, he was a priest. And he said, not on my watch. This thing is not happening while I'm alive. He had five sons. And they said, even though the whole of Israel forsake God, we will not forsake God. Even if everyone is afraid, we will not be afraid. We will lose our lives if we have to. And they decided, even as priests, even though we are priests, we are going to stand up and resist. And the army that stood up against this man called Antiochus was led by five priests, a man and his five sons, six priests. And these men actually formed a guerrilla army. They took up arms. They said, you know what? This thing we're going to fight if it means we die. And they began a guerrilla action. And when they had their first success, others began to join them. And pretty soon they were actually fighting a war against the most powerful empire, apart from Rome, the most powerful, the, their colonizer. They led a, a resistance against this colonizer. They fought actively. This man lost his life. Judas lost his life. But one of his sons stood up and stepped into the breach. And they fought that war. And guess what happened? Eventually, they actually took back the temple, took back Jerusalem, consecrated the temple, set up the worship of God again. And the people who knew their God were strong and firmly resisted him. It was so interesting because the Bible tells us that King Antiochus had the same fate as many who oppose God. That one day he was on a battle somewhere and he got strangely ill. He like Alexander, he just died of a disease. The the history tells us, by the way, that in the middle of attacking a village, he was suddenly struck down by abdominal pains. And there was a mysterious illness. When they took him off the battlefield, they found that there were worms in his stomach. And they say by the time he died, he was already stinking. While well, you're still alive, he was already stinking. Those necrosis, those just rotting happening in his body. And guess what? Daniel had already written about this. In Daniel chapter 8, in a very different prophecy before that, 8.25, he says, He will cause deceit to prosper. 
he will consider himself superior. When they feel superior, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. Oh my goodness. Guys, we're living, we're living in times that are written about. There's nothing random about 2023. There's nothing random about where you live right now and who you are. The fact that you're part of the Mavuno Church. The fact that God is preparing you for what he wants to do. He's setting the stage for the things he's doing in our life. The people who know their God will be strong and firmly resistant. The people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. What can we learn from this passage? Now that you've understood where this, this verse came from. And you've understood it wasn't just a nice random promise. There was some there was some background to it. There were some people who actually knew their God. These people knew their God enough to not be afraid of what reality was in front of them. They, were, they knew their God enough, they were willing to put down their lives for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of seeing God's work advance. Three things that I want us to understand from this passage. I've just given you a long history lesson, but three things I want you to understand from it. The first is we must, we must understand ultimate reality. Mavuno Church, we have no option. We must not live like the rest of the world. We must understand ultimate reality. It's look easy to look at the things around you and think they're happening randomly. It's easy to look at reality around you and think that things just are happening. Stuff happens. No, stuff doesn't happen. There is a God who is in charge of history. You need to understand we live in biblical times. The pandemics that we're seeing and that we will see. The wars that we're seeing and we will see. The efforts by governments across the world to control their citizens that we will see and we are seeing. And they're coming. They're coming. Back in the day, we used to be told about one day they're going to put a chip in you and you won't be able to trade and, and, and you won't be able to do anything or even buy things unless. And I remember I used to, read, I used to listen to these things. I say, are these people mad? Like how, which tech, what, how will they ever do such things? How can you put a chip in a human being? Oh my God. We live in the age when none of that stuff, any of the stuff in the Bible right now doesn't look like fiction. We have the technology to make it happen. And it actually is happening. You know, they say that in, in, in China, they have an app. You guys have heard about the app? And basically, everybody has that app. It's on your phone. Uh, and, and it basically is like a social control mechanism. And, and, and your app shows you your status. If your app is showing that your color is healthy, I, I don't know, maybe purple is healthiest, then you can do anything. You can buy at cheap prices, you can rent stuff, you can lease stuff, you can get a house. If your app is showing you in the red, then it means not downtown. <laughs> These ones are red, red hot fire. <laughs> but if your app is showing that you're in the red, then you can't trade. You can't actually do anything. You, uh, even rentals are more expensive. Your insurance is more expensive. And basically, the government has control on that app. And what, what they do with that app, and some of you have heard about this, what they do with that app is if you have a conviction, you go to prison, then you lose points. If you have a driving accident and you drive badly, you, you have a conviction. If you're caught without having filed your taxes, again, your, your points go down. If you're caught in any behavior that the state prescribes and says this is not acceptable behavior, your points go down. And here's the crazy thing. If I'm your friend, if I'm your friend and then you're up, points go down, mine get affected. So the first thing that people do when your points go down, so if, if, for, if for example, one of us has a father who goes to jail and that, that guy's points go down and affect their friend. Guess what happens? Everybody else around unfriends that person. Because it's like we don't want our points to go down. I, this, is, this is not f science fiction. We're living in biblical times. The technology is there. Yeah, I don't want to become an enemy of the state. But it's, it's happening all over. Kenya is actually on the leading edge of that revolution huh? in Africa. Um, we're, we're soon about to get that one personal identifier number that identifies you from birth 
till death. By the way, I'm, nothing, I'm not saying that number is a bad thing. When you think about it logically and when you think about it in terms of just managing people, it makes sense. But it's setting up a stage. And what that stage means is a time that will come when it will be very easy for you to be prescribed. You can't trade unless somebody approves your ability to trade. These things are things we might see in our generation. In fact, I'm increasingly convinced that we're going to see some of these things in our generation. So what do we do? We need to understand ultimate reality. We need to understand ultimate reality. You know, some of us get so caught up by the world that we think that's all that's there. Some of us in this country, we are so political that we are first UDA members or Azimio followers, then Jesus followers afterwards. I seem to have muted to the people on this side. I don't know if you, you've seen that, that there are some places you can't have an objective conversation. If you say anything wrong about the government, then you're obviously opposition. And it's like you can't have a voice. If you say anything wrong about the opposition, then you must be pro-government. And it's like even Christians have lost a voice. What is God saying about our nation? Forget what UDA is saying. Forget what Azimio is saying. What is God's voice? But we've gotten to a place where globally right now, you, and I think it's, is it true in Nigeria as well? Like people are just, people get cancelled. People are, people are called things. You almost can't give a political opinion because whatever you say, now you've been put in that camp. And some people have become so political that the political reality is all they see. They can't have a voice. If their party leader says something, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. It must be true. It's my truth. It's our truth. And I think, my goodness, that's your reality? Come on, don't be fooled. That is not ultimate reality. There's a higher reality than the political reality. God's people, we need to know this. For some of us, it's economic reality. It's become our ultimate reality. We look at the inflation that's increasing and the life that's getting harder. And we look like every man for himself, everyone has to do what he has to do to survive. And for some of us, we've come to the conclusion that attending a discipleship group, coming to church, coming to a worship night, that those things are secondary because we have to hustle. And it's like even God must understand, surely my job always comes first. That's idolatry. That's idolatry. Who is your ultimate reality? God must come first in your life. There's an ultimate reality above the economic reality. And God's people, in this season, I believe God wants us to learn how to live in the economic, economic reality of the kingdom. Kingdom economics. Yeah, we need to, start, we need to stop operating on, on the worldly economics. In the last couple of years, I've been giving some instructions on kingdom economics. One of the instructions I gave is, get out of debt. Get out of debt. The world system wants you in debt. And that's why wherever you go outside the church and start learning about finance, they'll teach you about debt. And people ask, but how come it's only the pastor who's telling me to get out of debt? Everybody else, rich people use debt. Have you heard that one? All rich people use it. Why? Why are you afraid of it? I'm not afraid of it. It's just the world's way. The Bible says that those who are, those who are in debt are slaves. The borrower is a slave. Why would you put yourself willingly into slavery when God's word has told you, do not take yourself back? Yeah, Galatians tells you, how, how do you take yourself back into slavery when Jesus set you free? So that was an instruction God gave us. I believe that, by the way, the instructions God is giving us financially in this season are to pull us out of dependence on the economic system of the world. So that we start operating on a very different economic system. This year's instruction was start saving. Have three to six months of savings that you're putting aside. By the way, I hope you're taking me seriously. I hope you're taking me seriously because I believe the Lord is preparing us for some times ahead. And by the way, the first time I told, when I talked about getting out of debt, I had no clue about what was going to happen in Ukraine and Israel. God just gave an instruction. But I believe that he wants his people to start operating very differently from the systems of the world. The world, has, the world is a matrix. It has co-opted us and we are blindly following it. But the people who know their God, the people who know their God, for other people, it's a cultural reality that has become our ultimate reality. Yes, I know I should pray more. Yes, I know I should disciple more. But my goodness, what about Netflix? And what about my time on social media? And what about my time on TikTok and, Sp and Spotify and hanging out with my friends? I love what Pastor Godwin said. I mean, you, you, you do a social media fast and it's like a drug addict in recovery. Yeah, in January, we're, going, we're doing another social media fast, guys. 21 days. Yeah, yeah. 
Just start, start preparing for it, by the way. And I believe that God is just weaning us off. Yeah, and some of us, we know, in fact, we shouldn't even be waiting for the fast. <laughs> we should be starting that fast now. Yeah, we need to actually start putting some boundaries around ourselves. One of the boundaries my wife and I put around ourselves recently, by the way, I, I don't talk as, whenever you hear me preach, never hear me preach as the guy who has everything. Because I'm learning with you. And several, several weeks ago, maybe a month ago, my wife, my, I, I got convicted. I listened to Pastor Benihin say, that he turned off all the TVs and the social media in his house and how he started paying attention to God's word more. And I don't have a TV in my house, but I was like, wow, okay. What if I turn off social media? What if I turn off my phone at 6 p.m.? I said, let me just start there. And I remember the first day I told my wife this, she was like, yeah, in fact, I've been wondering when God will speak to you about <laughs> She knows my issues. It's good to have an honest wife. She knows my issues. And the first day we sat down in the house, it was six, we were both in the house, then, and you know our kids aren't in the house, and we just looked at each other, and we were like, uh -huh. In Kikui, there's a nice word, you say, one. One is like, otherwise, <laughs> like, like, like those words you say when you have no words. It's like, okay, let's talk. And I, seriously, I realized, this is what social media does. It just kills your ability to just have an adult conversation for an hour. The same problem we have with God in prayer for an hour is the same problem we have with our marriages. Yeah. And we, are, we can't, we don't even know. You don't even know the struggle you're having to pray is because of social media and your phone. And so we just sat there and I think the first day was a little harder. But by the way, by the, by the end of the time, we actually, we had entered a story and I was like, wow, it's been a while since we had a deep story like this. And my goodness, the last month, nowadays I really look forward to just sitting with her and just talking. We just talk. Random things, by the way. Somebody just gives a story and then, and I think this is probably how our parents were. Like they talked about everything. Yeah. But nowadays it's just like, hey, hey, what's up, what's up? Hey, how's it working? <laughs> Guys, understand ultimate reality. Don't get caught up in cultural reality. There is an ultimate reality. God's reality is the ultimate reality. You know, I've enjoyed reading through the New Testament. And right now we're in the book of Hebrews, right? And we'll be reading Hebrews 11, the hall of faith. And I love that. In Hebrews 11, 24, verse 27, 20, 11, 24, 27, it says, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Oof. Like you guys, this is, you have adoption to the highest. It's like being adopted by the president of the United States. You're his adopted child. You have access to the highest universities of the land. But by faith, what does faith mean? He saw the ultimate reality. He saw a bigger reality. And he says he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disagree, dis, 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 disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. And by faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. Oh God, by faith, your people are about to leave Egypt. Yeah, there's an ultimate reality he's calling us to. Ah, may we embrace it. People, there's a bigger world. There's a spiritual world around you. And it's time for you to begin to connect with that spiritual world, to live by faith. Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You must believe he exists. By the way, if you knew God exists, there are things you wouldn't do. If you literally believed God was sitting next to you, there are some shows you would not even think about. Yeah. By the way, most of all our sin is driven by lack of faith. Because we say one thing, but we don't actually believe it. If I believe, by the way, there are some times when, when a pastor walks in to the house, and my goodness, the way people behave, you're like, Wow. My church is full of amazing people. Hey, shh. The way they just say, praise the Lord, pastor, and they give me stories. Ah! When the pastor comes, there's like a certain way people just operate. Have you? Yeah, yeah. But by the way, I'm not fooled. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, we change. And that's how we are sometimes when we're in church, we change. We don't realize God isn't in church. God exists everywhere. So how do I live by faith? 
It means wherever I'm talking, he's there. When I'm gossiping, I keep quiet because I'm like, oh my God, I was about to say this, but Jesus is here. Yeah. When I'm about to take something that's not mine, I realize, oh my God, he's here. Yeah, he's right here. I live by faith. And then I believe that he honestly rewards those who please him. Which means that I know I'm going to take a whole day at the gathering. Come on, I'm going to lose money in my business. Yes, yes, yes. But he honestly rewards. Yeah, 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 yeah. He rewards. I believe it. So I'm willing to sacrifice for him. It doesn't matter what they say. I believe it. This is how I base my life on. I have faith and I believe. When you read the whole of faith, it's not saying that these guys had intellectual assent to an idea. It means that they based their whole life around that agreement that God exists. The ultimate reality. The people who know their God. Are there some people who know their God in this house? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two. Number two. Prepare for battle. Prepare for battle. Yeah. Antiochus fought hard to abolish the sacrifices. He didn't know that he was just a pawn for the enemy. He was a human being who thought he was ambitious, but he didn't realize the devil was using his ambition, and the devil is still using the ambition of many today to crush the work of God. There's an enemy who hates God's people with a passion. And many Christians today, we're surprised when we face attacks by the enemy. We're, we're, we're surprised when we go on social media and people hate Christians, and people hate pastors, and they think that all churches are business, and they say disparaging things, and we're like, why are they saying this? Like, guys... There is an enemy. Sometimes Christians are surprised when there's a challenge to their marriage. And there's a problem in your business. I, since I started following Jesus, my business is it's just in trouble. What's happening, God? They're surprised when things are not working the way they want. We prayed and nothing. In fact, things have gotten worse. And you hear people telling you, Pastor, like, like what, what have I done wrong? Like, why does God hate me? Like, what's going on? Like, like, like what haven't I done? Like, like sometimes they even get to, does God even actually exist? Am I talking to somebody in the house? Yeah, sometimes you get to a place where you're like, does God, am I making him up? Like, why would a good person like me go through all this stuff? But I love what Pastor Gordon reminded us, was said earlier by Pastor Kevin. If you haven't met the devil lately, it's probably because you're walking in the same direction with him. Yeah. The minute you became a Christian, there was an, a big target that was put on your chest. You became an enemy of the kingdom. Of Satan hates you. Satan hates you with a passion. He detests you. He does. And he wants to destroy you. So, so stop looking surprised. Stop looking surprised. First Peter 4, 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery, fiery ordeal that has come to you to test you as though something strange is happening to you. Like, oh, why is our marriage suffering? Why are we going through such... Guys... The enemy hates you. Yeah, don't be surprised. You need to understand we're in a battle. But here's the thing. The battle is not fatal because the war was won. The war has been won. There's a great story that I had once about the World War. It talked about um, the difference between D-Day and V-E Day. D-Day was, it stands for some word like disembarkment or something like that. It's the day when the Allied forces landed in France in a place called Normandy. And they sent a thousand ships. It was a surprise. They had spent a lot of time making Hitler believe that they were going to attack in all kinds of places. Just so that he wouldn't, because he, they had guarded the coastline. And they had weaponry everywhere. But what this guy did is he, they, they sent messages. They cracked his codes and they sent messages trying to show they were going to attack somewhere else. So when he was distracted, they landed a thousand ships with 200,000 soldiers on a place called Normandy. And they were in Europe. And the minute it, was, it happened, it was a checkmate. Game over. Everybody knew, by the way, from that time on, the war was as good as over. Hitler had no answer to that move. And this was June the 6th, 1994. It's called D-Day. But here's the thing that happened. As much as Hitler was defeated, it wasn't until 11 months later Victory in Europe Day, VE Day, that Hitler and Germany unconditionally surrendered. So for 11 months, the enemy was fighting a battle that he had lost. He knew he had lost, but the Allies, having landed in Normandy, had to go town by town and liberate those towns. And I can tell you when they were fighting, they were still in danger. They were still being shot at. 
They were still finding an enemy that hated them. But here's the thing. As much as they were in that place, they were not fighting for victory. They were fighting from victory. That's the difference. And the same thing has happened for us as Christians. At the cross, 2,000 years ago, D-Day happened. Jesus won the victory for you. He's won it already. You're already victorious, by the way. Yeah, victory is ours. We are fighting on the winning side. The devil's number is up. It's finished. Jesus said it himself. He said, it's finished. The war is over. It's fought. It's finished. But there's a VE day that's coming. A day when Jesus will come from the clouds with a trumpet and a riding on a white horse. And people will, be find, will find themselves being lifted up, joining those who went before them. And we will join him in the air. The Bible tells us, guys, this is ultimate reality. It's ultimate reality. VE day is coming. And in the meantime, understand, you're a soldier for liberation. Yeah. The towns that the enemy has taken, you're here to take them back. Those relatives of yours that don't know Jesus, that's your job. You're here to fight for their victory. Imagine if the allied soldiers went into a town, won it, and then they sat there waiting for a party, to have a party. How do you do that? You don't do that. You take the victory that's been given to you. So we're here to say nobody dies on our watch. We're going to take back captives. We're going to storm the gates of hell. Every single relative of mine who is in those gates has to come out in Jesus' name. That's what we exist for. And so guys, understand and prepare for battle. Prepare for battle. When we come to our 430 prayers, guys, it's a training time. It's a training time. When I tell you put your videos on, I'm not doing it because I want to create a legalistic organization. I know the dangers of legalism, people. I would never, that's not my, my heart. I don't want to force you to become something like that. But I've also come to understand, <laughs> soldiers operate very differently from civilians. Yeah. People who win wars don't operate like civilians. Yeah, if you can't come up and be disciplined, if you can't even show up and do what your commanding officer has asked you to do, how will you ever be a soldier? You're going to be killed on the battlefield. It's a training space. And as we train together, we're going to start to see some amazing, I actually predict a time is coming when we'll see a rapid acceleration of salvation in our families. Because we are being armed and becoming better prayer warriors. Some of, the things that is keep, some of the things that are keeping people still in captivity is we've not yet understood how to pray together. But that time is coming and we are in training. So prepare, let your neighbor prepare for battle. Yeah, prepare for battle. Uh, the last thing, the last point. So first is understand ultimate reality. Number two, prepare for battle. Number three, resist the enemy. Resist the enemy. Even as you're preparing for battle, resist the enemy. Listen. We must resist the enemy. James wrote in James chapter 4 verse 7, Submit yourselves to God, resist the enemy, and he will... Oh, come on, somebody. Yeah. I loved prayer this morning. Pastor James was just dropping the word like this, eh? like hotcakes. And, and one of the words he gave us this morning is he said, Listen, you're already seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. When you understand that, you understand that the devil is below you. Yeah, he's already below you. And what he wants you to know is, he doesn't want you to understand your position in Christ. He wants you to fight thinking that he's the one who is ascendant, as opposed to understanding who you are. But the Bible says when you resist him, uh -uh, he flees. You know, it's so funny because he comes loudly, like a lion. Wah! And then you resist him. Speak to the hand. And the Bible says, what does he do? He runs. He runs. What? Like, what a shock. Yeah. You know, many times we're praying for relatives and saying, God, save this person, please. God said, ah, I've given you the formula. Resist. Resist. The devil will flee. I'm going to share a testimony when I, in my next talk. From Mavuno Diani. Of, of cancer being healed. Because people have learned to resist. In our baby church, by the way, one of our baby churches, as people have begun to understand how to pray together and resist, they have seen in the last two weeks, two people healed of cancer. Two people. Yeah? Resist. The devil flees. He flees. 
when you understand your position. He flees when you understand how to resist him. The people who know their God. Ah, come on somebody. You can't resist the devil unless you know your God. Ah, this thing we're talking about reading the scriptures together. It's not a legalist. It's not a thing we're doing because that's what Christians do. It's because you need to know your God. And when you know your God, you know who you are. And when you know who you are, you can resist. And the devil flees from you. You just resist. Yeah. But there are some people in this room, when they pray, all heaven notices. Yeah. Yeah. And the crazy thing is, they may not be the oldest Christians that you are looking at, who have been saved for 20 years. Yeah. It may not even be the pastor, by the way. Yeah. There are some people who have understood their position in Christ. And they have understood how to resist. And the devil wants us to enter into a season of resisting. I, 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 sorry, God wants us to enter into a season of resisting the devil. Yeah? And that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about discipleship. That's why you hear me talking about in this season, we must become disciples. Not people who have ascent, mental ascent. We must become people who understand how to follow somebody who's following Jesus. That's how discipleship was done. That's how Jesus did it. That's how the apostles did it. That's how we do it in our time. Let me give you a secret, people. When I asked you, when I asked you <laughs> to pray at 4.30, it wasn't because God told me to pray at 4.30. It's because that's the time I pray. And I want you to follow me as I follow Christ. Yeah, that's why. There's no other reason, by the way. There's no other reason. When I told you to do a 21-day fast two years ago and to do a liquid fast, it wasn't because I went and read somewhere that liquid, that this is how people fast. It's because that's how I fast. <laughs> yeah. So I was basically telling you, follow me as I follow Christ. And it's not that I'm brilliant. It's that as your leader, I am keen to follow Jesus. And I also know as you follow, you will also see some of the victories and breakthroughs that have been in this church will become your breakthroughs. And today you're experiencing those breakthroughs. There are some of you who are even doing greater things than anything I've ever done simply because you're following. I mean, today, Pastor James was here with his small army. These guys, when was it that you guys were doing prayers? When, when are you doing this my five-hour prayers of yours? Was it last week? This past week, they prayed together for five hours, two days, continuously. Five hours. Have you ever prayed for five hours continuously? Yeah. As in... The people who are following me, now, because they are following me, now they are beginning to understand. It's like, this is how we follow, and then they're even passing. Because me, I don't pray five hours <laughs> yet. <laughs> yeah. But as you follow, something begins to happen in your life. You begin to be opened up to understand how to, who God is. You stop living a complacent, individualistic, little Christian life. Because that's not what God created you for. Let me tell you this. Another secret. I got you reading the Bible. We've been reading the Bible through for the last how many years? But I can tell you this, ever since I was a young Christian, I've read through the Bible every year, all through the New Testament. So I'm not inventing stuff. I'm just saying, guys, this is what has helped me know God. This is what has helped me be able to achieve the things I've achieved. I'm going to help you do this. But listen, as you do them, help your disciples do them, and the thing that God has given you, the anointing, the special anointing in your life, will also overflow in their lives as well. And this is how we become an army. We begin to understand our reality. We begin to prepare our battle. And we begin to resist the enemy. There's a place you get to as a church where the devil cannot come anywhere near you. Yeah. There are realms like those guys. Where the enemy cannot even come. He dare not come around you as a church. He cannot attack you. Because he knows what is happening in that place. And 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 to 5 tells us, Though we live in the world... We don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. You know that verse? On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Is that verse there? Oh, it's there. Yeah. The weapon, let's read it together. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Come on, let's go to verse 5. We demolish arguments 
and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's what discipleship is about. Discipleship is when you begin to take captive the, the, the prevailing political climate of the world that has enslaved us. And we make it obedient to Christ. We take captive the economic realities of this world and we make them obedient to Christ. In discipleship, we say it doesn't matter what your boss has said. At 4.30, we are praying. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I'm not stressed because I know where the real answers come from. Yeah. My place of prayer. That's what we do. That's how we do it. And God's people, as we follow these principles, you will see the enemy fleeing away from you. Tell your neighbor, prepare for battle. Prepare for battle. Guys, I want to conclude. But let me say this. There are certain things that you will experience in your life simply because of understanding what it means to be the people who know their God. Yeah, the people who know their God. We've been misled over the years to believe that knowing God is understanding the scripture and praying by yourself in your house and, and, and just having secret. No, that's not it. Seeking deep secrets of revelation, that's not what it is. The, the smallest saint in this house who is united with other saints is much more powerful than any prayer warrior out there. Yeah. There's a thing that God wants to do with the people. I want you to notice that. It doesn't say the person. Because some of us have been saying that about ourselves. The people. You're not our people. The people who together know their God. This is how we resist him. As an army, as a unit, as a family. Loving one another. Not fighting with the weapons of this world. Loving each other enough to sacrifice and pray for one another. Come on somebody. Who prays for somebody else for an hour? That person is here. Where you see this, this relative has, this person's relative has cancer. We are coming together as a discipleship group. And we are going to fast until something happens. We will resist together until something happens. And you're going to start to see some miracles you would never have imagined. Let's say it together. The people who, who know their God shall be strong and do exploits.